Hello, thank you for watching my video. Uh, today I'll be talking about my research into how to reduce the public speaking anxiety of Japanese university students using virtual and imaginal exposure training techniques. So my name is Josh Bernati. I'm an associate professor at Aichi Prefecture University in central Japan. I've been interested for a few years into how to use VR as a learning tool in the English classroom. Myself and Professor Chris Hastings began designing activities based on this kind of low cost smartphone VR that's now available to us. Uh, using a type of headset that's very cheap like Google Cardboard, it's now possible to implement VR activities in almost every classroom. If students have smartphones, they can supply for these headsets. Professor Hastings and I also started to research how to use VR to prepare students for studying abroad. And we designed a few programs that help to reduce this kind of pre-departure anxiety by letting students visit the campuses and the cities they'd be studying in before they go study abroad using apps like Google Street View that you see here. This eventually evolved into trying to figure out ways of reducing presentation anxiety using VR. And luckily there's a very useful uh, smartphone app called Virtual Speech you can use in combination with VR headsets that lets you practice presentations in front of virtual audiences. And so now as part of my PhD program at Nagoya University, I'm exploring how we can use apps like this with Japanese students to help reduce this kind of public speaking anxiety. So some key concepts for this program I'd be talking about today. Anxiety is highly pervasive. Many people around the world suffer from anxiety, also in Japan as well. And anxiety in all its forms can severely uh, influence our ability to teach and students' ability to learn and classroom success in the end. VR-based exposure therapy has been shown to be very effective in therapeutic settings, but it hasn't been used as much in educational settings. So I want to explore this gap in the literature and see if we can use VR as a way of reducing anxiety in Japanese university classrooms. We've all experienced anxiety to some extent, and basically it happens when your brain is anticipating a difficult or aversive event. And the symptoms of anxiety can manifest themselves either psychologically or physiologically. There are a lot of these kinds of symptoms and they can affect your ability to function, especially in the classroom. It's the most commonly diagnosed disorder in the West, in the US and Europe. So we can expect a high prevalence of anxiety in Asia as well. Public speaking phobia, when it reaches this clinical level, is a subset of social anxiety disorder. And this is because this kind of phobia is really related to feelings and fears about judgment by other people. And this can be combated with exposure therapy. We'll explain a bit about this. University students around the world are feeling more anxiety about presentation skills because lots of employers in various countries are telling universities that students are graduating without the public speaking skills that they need for future workplaces. So universities are feeling this pressure to teach these presentation skills. But students come into the classroom with a lot of social anxieties that might include communication apprehension, which can be troublesome in language classrooms, of course, and even classroom communication anxiety, which involves working with other students, being called on by the teacher. And all of these anxieties can negatively affect GPA and then success in future employment. Foreign language anxiety is its own special type of anxiety that is distinct from communication apprehension and other forms of social anxiety disorder. It can be facilitating, you can be encouraged and motivated by foreign language anxiety to learn and produce correct forms. But if it reaches debilitating levels, it can have a big impact on our ability to learn successfully. But we can adjust for this as teachers by creating positive relationships with our students and between students and building up the successes of students and giving them agency in the classroom. 
Psychotherapists measure anxiety in a variety of ways using standardized instruments like you see here. And then even uh, language researchers like Horowitz have designed scales like the foreign language classroom anxiety scale, which measures foreign language anxiety specifically. Although anxiety is highly pervasive, it is also very treatable. And there are a lot of very effective techniques for treating anxiety among psychotherapists, including cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness training and exposure therapy. So for this program, I'm, use, I'm using a combination of, of the, these three types of anxiety reduction techniques. Exposure therapy is very successful in uh, dealing with anxieties and phobias. But until VR, there were two main types of exposure therapy in vivo, where you come face to face with the thing that produces the phobia and imaginal exposure therapy, where you're just imagining the, the negative stimuli. But VR-based exposure therapy or in virtual therapy is a nice in-between of these two, and we'll see why. In virtual exposure therapy has been used for the last 30 years or so. It's quite a long history. Um, but it hasn't become widely used because it's been cost prohibitive up to this point, even though there's uh, evidence for success of in virtual exposure therapy. Therapists had to design their own software or buy very expensive hardware to implement this. But now that we have smartphone VR and headsets like Google Cardboard, it's possible to use in classrooms and in many therapeutic settings. So I said that in virtuo exposure therapy can be a nice in-between of the therapy types here uh, because in vivo can often be too intense, coming into contact with a snake when you're afraid of snakes. And imaginal can sometimes feel too removed. VR is a nice in-between because you get the stimuli that produces the phobia, but your brain realizes it's in a safe environment. And for social anxiety, this can have a face-saving element as well. So this study is a partial replication study of some earlier studies done by these researchers here uh, that are specifically targeting public speaking phobia using VR. And some of these more recent studies use a suite of treatments like I did as well, using cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, and exposure training. And they found uh, some very positive results, increased willingness to communicate and a reduction in this kind of public speaking phobia and communication apprehension. The mindfulness techniques I used are based on the work of Professor Mark Williams, who founded the Oxford Mindfulness Center. If you've never tried mindfulness before, I really uh, encourage you to try it. It's not like our concepts of meditation. It's not about clearing your mind. It's about directing your focus, um, paying attention, especially to your breathing, and not judging yourself or trying to do something in the moment that you're doing the meditation. And the promising thing about this is that Williams argues it can be successful in a short period. My program is an intensive short-term program. So I thought that mindfulness might be effective even over a short term like I'm doing. So I have several research questions for this program. I wanted to find out more about Japanese university students' public speaking anxiety. Where does it come from? What are they doing to fight against it? What strategies do they have? And also whether a short-term program like mine can be effective at reducing public speaking anxiety, even if it's a short-term course. I also wanted to parse out whether VR in virtual exposure therapy is more successful than tr more traditional types of exposure like imagination-based exposure. So from these research questions, I developed two hypotheses. One, that the intensive program will show a reduction in public speaking anxiety over the course of the treatment, so within the factor of time, and that there would be a significant difference between the, in the virtual reality-based group and the control group, which just used imagination-based practice. The participants were 20 participants, so a pretty small-scale study to begin. Uh, most of them were in their first or second year of study, and 85% of them were female, which is pretty standard for foreign language uh, departments like I drew from for these participants. I gave them a pre-study questionnaire about their anxiety levels, and you can see how they broke down here, with a majority of them 
in the quite anxious category. And I use these, this pre-study survey to balance the control and experimental groups with this anxiety level in mind. And a manipulation check showed that there was no difference between the initial anxiety levels of the two groups. So I think I did a good job balancing these groups at the start. So I want to talk about my methodology because I used a lot of different techniques over the course of this program. Um, I taught them presentation skills training based on my own experience and based on the work of presentation trainers. I taught them about mindfulness and how to do mindfulness meditation at home. And I taught them a lot of the psychoeducational uh, techniques I had learned, like emotional regulation and directed focus, and gave them chances to talk to each other. The main difference were between the two groups were what kind of exposure training they did at home. The control group or group A used imagination-based practice. And the experimental group, group B, used VR in virtual exposure training at home with 10 participants in each of these groups. Uh, I had four research sessions with them face-to-face. -face. Uh, this is before COVID, so don't worry, this is last year. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about the materials in each one and what I used and what kind of activities. So session one was getting started talking about uh, privacy and consent and taking the foreign language classroom anxiety scale at the, the onset of this program. I also conducted individual interviews with participants in which they told me their self-reported uh, public speaking anxiety level on a scale of one to 10. And I also had them do presentations in front of fellow participants to measure their baseline presentation skills and then began some of the psychoeducational materials that I prepared for it. After each research session, they did some work at home. And this was crucial to the program. So after this first session, they did some journaling. Journaling is a big part of cognitive behavioral therapy as well. It's really important to write down our thoughts, especially when we have anxiety. So they wrote down their expectations for the program and then also did something called the inner critic journaling, which is developed by Esposito, uh, in which you think about the negative thoughts you have internally while you're doing the presentation and after a presentation. So they wrote down some of these negative thoughts they have about their own presentation skills. Ses from session two, we started getting into the heart of the program. And I presented a lot of the psychoeducational material that I had learned, uh, including uh, panic control treatment, how to notice the panic response and how to regulate it through positive imagery and breathing techniques. I also taught them about mindfulness and guided them through a short mindfulness meditation in person. And we did a lot of other activities like this uh, based on presentation skills trainers like Esposito. From session two at home, this is when they started doing the exposure training that I taught them how to do. And this was a step-by-step -step process where they reviewed the course program from this session two, the, the skills we had learned. They went through a mindfulness meditation using guided audio that I provided. And then they did their presentation practice. This was the exposure training that they did. The control group used their imaginations, imagined an audience, they chose a topic from a list of possible topics I gave them and then spoke for about five minutes to this imaginary, imaginary audience. The experimental group brought home VR headsets that I trained them how to use and how to and used in conjunction with the virtual speech smartphone application. Virtual speech lets you practice presentations in several different settings. And this is also a key part of extinction learning, which is how we uh, pull ourselves away from the negative, negative associations that produce phobias. This is part of, of exposure therapy. So practicing in different locations is key to this extinction learning. So you can practice in a big auditorium like you see here, or even in a classroom setting. So just like the control group, they did presentation practice, but this time in front of a virtual audience. During each research session at the beginning, they also discussed their experiences uh, from their home practice with each other and got a chance to kind of share their experiences. Session three, we got more into presentation skills training. And I used the book by Anderson, who is one of the founders of TED Talks, in how to structure a good speech, how to create good materials, and how to find good role models 
for public speakers. I also taught them techniques from cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which have to do with recognizing cognitive distortions. A lot of times anxiety comes from disconnects between what we think and actual reality. And when you do journaling and try to locate these dysfunctional cognitions, cognitive distortions, a lot of times you can overcome them. We also learned a more advanced mindfulness meditation called the befriending meditation in which you try to develop a more positive relationship with the audience, the public speaking audience. After session three, they once again did the exposure training, step-by-step uh, -step, reviewed the program techniques, did a mindfulness meditation, and then did their practice, either imaginal or VR-based. Session four, we wrapped everything up and we once again took the foreign language classroom anxiety scale to measure their foreign language anxiety. I did individual interviews with each participant and then they once again did presentations, but this time they had a list of techniques they had learned in the program that they could choose from to use for this final in-person presentation. So I'd like to talk about my results. So in the two interviews, I asked them to report on their public speaking anxiety on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the highest. You can see here the individual scores for the control and experimental groups and how they changed from the beginning and end of the program. And you can see that all of the participants reduced their self-reported anxiety levels, except for one who stayed the same. When I looked at the means of both groups, the control and experimental, both groups saw a nearly 40% reduction in their mean public speaking anxiety scores from before and after the program. So because of the small nature of this program, only 20 participants in total, I used non-parametric tests to check for significance. So first with the within groups factor of time, so before and after the program, here I used a Wilcoxon signed rank test to check if there was a significant decrease in anxiety. And both the control and experimental groups saw a statistically significant median decrease in their presentation anxiety from before and after the program. So this supported H1. But for the between groups factor of treatment type, so imaginal exposure training versus virtual reality-based exposure training, here I use a Man whitney u test, and there was not a significant difference between these two groups. I also tested for their foreign language anxiety using the FLACAS. For the mean scores for the control and experimental groups, there was a slight decrease in these mean scores. Using again a Wilcoxon signed rank test, I checked for differences before and after the program, the within groups factor, and only the experimental group, the VR group, saw a significant decrease in foreign language anxiety from before and after the program. And a man whitney U test uh, looking at the between groups factor of treatment type did not see a significant difference in foreign language anxiety. So this program used a convergent mixed methods design. So I had both quantitative data in the form of the FLACAS and self-reported anxiety level scores, but I also did these extensive interviews with students and did qualitative analysis. So for this, I used a thematic analysis based on the work of Braun and Clark. And I'll just show you a little bit of this. There's a lot of this data, so I'll highlight some of the key takeaways. And I also checked for inter-rater reliability with this thematic analysis. Uh, my PhD supervisor, Professor Jiro Takai at Nag University also assigned these codes and themes. And using Cohen's Kappa, we found that there was a high level of inter-rater reliability within this thematic analysis. So I asked participants to talk about the sources of their presentation anxiety. And here's some of the major themes we found. They often uh, attributed it to either internal, external, or speech specific sources of anxiety with the majority being external sources. This especially included fears about people watching you and people's eyes on you. This seemed to be a very key source of anxiety for them. Internal sources included fear of making mistakes or trouble remembering what you wanted to say. I also asked them to talk about their goals for improving their public speaking skills. I thought this would be useful to educators like me and they broke down pretty equally between psychological content and performance-oriented goals. 
And some of the key ones here, they did seem to have a meta-awareness of their own nervousness and anxiety and wanted to decrease it. And also just, uh, showed a desire for improving their delivery methods, including using gestures and body language and expressions. For content, they especially wanted to improve their foreign language skills, since many of these students were performing public speak speech acts in their second language. In session four, I also conducted individual interviews. So some of the themes from some of these post-interview questions. So I asked them to reflect on changes that had happened as a course of over the course of the program. And the majority of their comments about this focused on improvements they had made, uh, which was very positive to me. And they a lot of them expressed a belief in the effectiveness of the program techniques that they had learned and cited a, redu a reduction in nervousness and anxiety. But about 13% of their comments from this question uh, were about remaining issues. So there was some lingering nervousness and anxiety even after this program. So differences between the control and experimental groups. I asked the imagination exposure training group to reflect on their home practice and how effective it was. And the comments broke down like this, with almost 90% of them being positive. Many of them talked about feelings of accomplishment when they did the practice at home, feeling relaxed, thought it was useful. But there were negative comments that were telling, especially a difficulty in imagining a virtual audience. And this was one of the advantages of the VR, being able to see the audience when they practice. The experimental group was asked the same question, but about their VR-based exposure training at home. And these were more mixed. Only about 70% of these comments were positive and 30% negative. A lot of the negative comments had to do with specifics about the virtual speech app. And a lot of them became habituated over time, especially because the virtual audience is a video, but it's on a loop. And once you notice the loop and where it begins and ends, you start to see less effectiveness in uh, being seen by this virtual audience. But there were a lot of positive comments about the VR too, which is very nice to hear. Both groups were asked if this home practice helped reduce their public speaking anxiety with 100% of the control group saying yes, and then a more mixed response from the experimental group. So I think I learned a lot from this first year of the program. Uh, and this is a, a program using funds from the Japanese government, Kakenhi. So I'm gonna continue this program over the next few years, including this year. And I think there's a lot of positive takeaways from this first year. So effectiveness, the effectiveness of this kind of short-term program. So even an intensive program only over four sessions can be effective at reducing their public speaking anxiety. So I really encourage other educators to try these kind of programs as well. H2 wasn't supported, so VR was not seen as more useful. And in fact, more issues with the VR were seen in these post-study interviews. But both of these groups, control and experimental, saw a significant decrease in their public speaking anxiety. And my takeaway for this is that educators can use the tools that they have at their disposal. So if they're interested in VR, students want to try VR, they can expect some positive results practicing presentations in VR. But if you want to go a more low-tech route and use imagination-based practice, this can also be effective. As educators, we must target both external and internal sources of this public, public speaking anxiety. So when you work with students in this capacity, try to target both of these. What's happening within them that's causing anxiety? And then what are these external factors that you can try to mitigate? Uh, there were a lot of limitations with the virtual speech app, but hopefully, uh, these free to use apps continue to improve. So I hope to create a manual on how other educators can create programs like this as well, or implement programs like this. And I hope that other uh, educators will also replicate this kind of study to see if they have similarly successful results. I also hope to add a VR playback function to this program using panoramic cameras like the Rico Theta you see here. If you record students doing speech acts with this kind of camera, they can watch themselves back in VR and then analyze their own performance 
and how the audience is engaging with them. Okay, these are the sources I use for today. All right, thank you for listening. If you would like to talk to me about this, please email me anytime. Here's my email address. Okay, thank you everybody for watching.